Achan Nisabo had sent me a list of um, topics that he thought might be useful for me to talk about. And I was attracted to the topic of bodhicitta, which is the aspiration to become fully awakened for the benefit of all beings. Um, and I think that may have been what was advertised for this session. But I've decided to talk about something else because of what's happening here in the Abbey. Some of you may have heard about this situation, some have not. I know Achan Nisabo is aware of it. Um, so we have a Tibetan Lama, Geshe Chudak, who has been resident here for more than a year now, and he's one of the teachers here. And about 10 days, 11 days ago, he disappeared. And the whole area has been searched. There, there was a, a search and rescue operation going on for about four days with volunteers from the local community who were trained in this kind of thing. They had dogs, they had drones, they had, you know, different uh, equipment, even a helicopter flying overhead one day. But they, we haven't found a trace, any trace of him. And then the local sheriff decided to stop the search and rescue operation on the ground after four days. Um, but other methods have been used. They put posters around and alerted various um, police, law enforcement agencies around the area. And people here in the Abbey have continued searching and friends of the Abbey and so on. So we're continuing to explore different possibilities of where he might be, what might have happened to him. But as of now, we still don't know. So it's like very uncertain. And it's very troubling. It's, you know, if you, if, if you imagine if you were living in a community with one of your teachers, like Achan Nisabo, and then all of a sudden he disappeared and he couldn't be found anywhere and, and didn't leave a note saying where he had gone. So if you imagine that kind of situation, I think you can understand how difficult that is, how challenging that is. This, um, you know, brings up worry, of course, worry and, and sadness, um, depression, despondency, those kind of feelings can come up and confusion, like what could have happened? Where could he be? Is this uncertainty. <clears throat> so it's been a challenging situation, but the community has been handling it very well. Thanks to the Dharma, we have so many wonderful tools, methods within the Dharma, the Buddhist teachings to use in times like this. Um, so that's what I would like to talk about. Um, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's one body of teachings and practices called Lojong, which translates as mind training or sometimes people call it thought training or thought transformation. So the basic idea is working with our mind, working with our thoughts and emotions to uh, reduce the disturbing negative ones and increase the positive beneficial ones. So it's transforming our mind. And within Lojong, within mind training, there's one section that's called transforming adversities into the path or transforming problems into the path. So it means, you know, when we face problems, difficulties in our life, our normal reaction is to feel, oh, no, I don't want this. Why is this happening? And we can easily get upset. We can get angry. We can blame, try to find someone out there to blame. 
um, our mind can go around in circles of, yeah, worry and unhappiness and confusion and so on. So people normally react that way when when they face problems. Um, but problems don't have to be bad experiences that we react to in that way. Um, they can actually be used in our path in our practice to to um, purify our mind and grow positive qualities learn positive qualities and so yeah this this body of teachings is particularly um, powerful and beneficial and i'll just share a few of the specific um pieces of advice for how we can uh, transform or utilize problems in the path. <clears throat> um, so there's one text, a re really wonderful text, uh, written by an Indian master named Shantideva, who lived about a thousand years, maybe more, th more than that. And um, this text is called Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, the Bodhicharyavatara. And in that text, there's one verse, I love this verse, very, very helpful. He says, why be unhappy about something if it can be remedied? And what is the use of being unhappy about something if it can't be remedied? So the basic idea is if there's a situation that we don't want, we don't like a problem happening. Um, again, our usual reaction is to be unhappy and maybe worried, anxious, angry, and so on. So kind of not very helpful thoughts and emotions coming up. So he's saying, instead of that, look to see if there's some remedy, something you can do about it. You know, if, if there's a way to solve this problem, this situation. And if there is, do it. Put your energy into that. Put your energy into doing things that will uh, solve the problem or at least alleviate the problem rather than just sitting there and letting your mind go in circles of worry and unhappiness or getting together with other people and talking uh, in ways that just increase everyone's uh, worry and anxiety and so on. Um, so do something, in other words, do something, at least try. There may not always be things that can be done, but, you know, usually there are, and, and we should at least try to do those things. And then the second part of the verse is, you know, if there isn't any solution, if there isn't anything that can be done, um, what use is it to worry? What use is it to be unhappy? What use is it to let our mind get caught up in those patterns of thinking? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to avoid. <laughs> it is. You do have to make effort to not let your mind go down those trails of unhappiness and worry and, and you know, worst case scenarios and, and so on. But with mindfulness and introspective awareness, clear comprehension, paying attention to what our mind is doing, if we notice that it is caught up in those kinds of thoughts, which aren't helpful, then we can put a stop to it and instead put our energy and our attention into something that is um, beneficial. So um, we have been reminded of this verse by various teachers and also reminding ourselves of this verse and trying to put it into practice. So we have been doing whatever we can to look for our teacher. Um, and um, and also on the spiritual level, doing prayers and um, asking our other our other teachers for prayers and so forth, working on our mind, working on our thoughts. 
So we are, you know, using our intelligence and our energy to do things that are practical, practical solutions to the problem. And when those have been exhausted and we still haven't found a solution, which is the case now, oh, well, we're still, we're, you know, we're still hopeful. We're still optimistic and still hopeful, still exploring various possibilities. Um, but as far as searching, you know, physically going out and searching, we pretty much exhausted those possibilities. So then um, we're just continuing our monastic um, program, our monastic schedule. We're planning uh, in two weeks, we're going to be starting a, a, a one month retreat and, and so on. So we're continuing with our our lifestyle and our activities as as monastics and of course you know keeping our vows so we're yeah th those are the things that we're doing that are helpful and really trying not to let our mind go into states that are unhelpful so that's yeah that's one tool um, that particular verse from Shanti Deva. It's it's a little bit like it reminds me of this um, what's called the Serenity Prayer in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just you know different wording, but I really I really like that one too. It goes something well. It's uh, there's a Christian version of it, but there's also a more secular version of it that goes something like um, May I have the courage to change what can be changed, the serenity to accept what can't be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. I may have gotten that a little out of order, but anyway, that's the basic idea. And it's very similar to what Shanti Deva says, because yeah, certainly there are situations where we can do something. We can change ourselves. we can change um, the situation that we're in. Um, so if there, there is that possibility of making changes, then do it, go for it, have the courage to do that. But then there are also situations where we can't change, we can't change ourselves. we can't change the situation, then it's much better to accept it. And then we also need the, the wisdom to be able to know the difference between what can and can't be changed. So we can't necessarily have that kind of wisdom right from the beginning, but slowly, especially when we make mistakes, make, um, you know, try something and it doesn't work, then we can learn from that. And slowly our wisdom, our understanding of what can be done and what can't be done will, will grow. So that's one, um, of the tools for um, thought transformation, for dealing with problems and transforming them into the path. And another one is um, impermanence, recalling impermanence, which the Buddha spoke about a lot, really emphasized that we keep in mind and reflect on again and again. So, all the things in our own being, like our five aggregates, our body and mind, as well as all the things in the world around us, other people, other beings, um, phenomena in the world, situations, all of these are impermanent, meaning that they, they don't remain the same, even from one tiny moment to the next, the, their very nature is that they are changing. And we don't normally see things that way. Our tendency is to see things as fixed, permanent, unchanging. And that leads to a lot of problems, a lot of unhappiness. Like we want a person that we care about that is important to us. We want them to always be there, to not change, to never go away, to never die. And that's simply asking for the impossible, because that person is inevitably going to pass away, going to disappear from our life. 
and moment by moment, day by day, they're getting closer to that. And we too are getting closer to the time when we will go out of existence. So trying to grasp at things as permanent and fixed, unchanging, wanting them to always stay the same, wanting them to always be there is unrealistic. It's just going against reality. And it leads to so much unhappiness. That's why people get unhappy and even um, you know, fall into despair, feel devastated when they do lose a person or some cherished possession that they wanted to always be there. It's because they didn't realize that it was impermanent. So the more we make ourselves familiar with impermanence and come to accept the impermanent nature of things, then the less um, anxiety and grief and unhappiness we will have when some kind of change does come about, like this situation that we're in now. So that's another very, very helpful tool for um, dealing with problems, because if there's a problem and we look at our reaction to that problem and ask ourselves, what did I expect? What were my expectations? We'll probably recognize that you know there was some expectation of permanence that this that person or that situation that we liked so much we wanted them to always remain the same and not change and so was that realistic was it realistic of me to expect that so i think hopefully you can see how that kind of um that view of things as permanent not accepting things as impermanent can lead to a lot of the unhappiness that we have when we do face problems. Um, and then one of my favorite tools when you know dealing with problems is um, using them to develop compassion. So compassion is um, awareness of suffering, unhappiness, problems, and being moved by that, being concerned about that. And um, traditionally in Buddhism, compassion is talked about in terms of others, having compassion for others, but we also need to have compassion for ourselves, which isn't always the case, especially in the West. Many people are hard on themselves, self-critical, even self-hating. Um, so we do need to extend compassion to ourselves as well, but not only ourselves. <laughs> yeah, in Buddhism, we work on developing compassion for every person and every being without exception, not leaving anybody out. And so that involves just having this awareness that people and living beings experience suffering, experience problems. Everybody has problems. Even people who are like billionaires or celebrities, beautiful people who seem to have magical lives, wonderful lives, and we may think they don't have any problems. That's not true. They have problems too. Everybody has problems. And um, so everyone deserves compassion. And the way to <clears throat> develop compassion and increase compassion is to develop greater awareness of suffering and problems. So one way to do that is when we ourselves encounter a problem, um, of course, we tend to get very caught up in my problem and worried about my problem and want to solve my problem and, and that's fine you know it's fine to search for solutions to try to remedy our problems but we can also use this situation to contemplate the suffering and problems of others to realize i'm not the only person in the world that is going through a problem right now at this very moment when i have this problem there's probably millions 
billions of other people and other living beings who are also having problems, who are also going through a difficulty. Oh, so then thinking about them enables us to increase our compassion because we can think just as this problem is difficult for me, it's difficult for them. And just as I want to be free of this problem, so do they. And wouldn't that be wonderful? How wonderful that would be, how much I wish for that. I really wish all those other people, all those other beings to be free from their suffering, just as I want to be free from my suffering. So we can use, that's just just a simple example of how we can use a problem, a difficulty we're going through to increase our compassion, our awareness of the suffering and problems of others. And um, I mean, if there are things we can do practically to help others um, be relieved of their suffering and problems, then of course that's excellent to put our energy into that. Um, but, you know, we're just one person with one face, one mouth, two hands, two legs. <laughs> we're limited in what we're able to do at this point in time, but we can aspire. We can have the aspiration to develop ourselves more and more, develop our, um, our good qualities, our abilities, and be more and more capable of helping others which is one of the goals in the in the path, the Buddhist path. Um, and actually, this is actually also quite practical because when, you know, if we don't think about others, if we get totally absorbed in our own suffering, our own problem, then it has the effect of make the problem seeming much better bigger than it really is, much worse than it really is, like that expression, making a mountain out of a molehill. Sometimes the problem could actually be quite small, but because we're so worried, so upset, so unhappy, our mind just keeps thinking about it again and again, and then it can seem really huge. Um, and if we think about the problems of others, especially those who have worse problems than we do, which is definitely the case. Yeah, some people have unbelievable problems, like right now, the people in Gaza, um, people in Ukraine. And if we compare our problem with what those people are going through, then our problem seems very small, more like a, a molehill rather than a mountain. And so when it seems smaller compared with the problems of others, then it seems more manageable. We, we, we have this feeling, okay, it's not that bad. I can manage it. So it sort of gives us a sense of, of courage and resilience, fortitude to be able to manage our problem. So that's a side effect. You know, the real purpose is having compassion for the suffering of others, but in the mean, but you know, as a side effect of that, um, we also gain greater courage and resilience and ability to manage our problem rather than feel as if it's this huge weight and we're kind of being buried under it. So those are just a few. Um, methods from the Buddha's teachings on how we can use um, the Dharma um, to, to deal with problems and difficulties, adversities that happen in our life. And it's good to start with small ones, um, little things that happen in our daily life and, and get familiar with doing this with small problems. And then gradually we can do it with bigger problems and eventually even when really big problems come like being diagnosed with a terminal illness or getting some terrible inner injury or losing someone who's really really precious to us we'll already have experience in this kind of practice and we'll be able to go to it and use it and find a lot of relief so i'll stop there leave some time if anyone would like to ask a question about anything that I've said or 
if you're curious about um, the tradition of Buddhism that I've been part of for most of my life, <laughs> I'll be happy to do my best to answer. <clears throat> I can start us off because sometimes it helps to have a rip the bandaid off <laughs> and I'm not shy. Um, I, I like the Shanti Deva quote and thank you so much for your teachings and um, wonderful advice about handling um, difficult circumstances as you are doing now. I find the Shanti Deva quote a little bit idealistic um, and sometimes there's, there's like a there's a part of, of attempting to you know why be unhappy about something when you could just not be unhappy about it is a great concept. And a lot of us like are striving to achieve that. But what about the like real consequences of like, you know, grief in the moment when you, when, you know, these are all really great tools to, to practice, but to just say to not be happy about something can sometimes feel a little bit like repressive or also to use another analogy it, it kind of feels like making a molehill out of a mountain sometimes yeah and I just wonder like uh I think you touched on it with like how we use compassion to transform those thoughts but what are your thoughts about just kind of the the dangerous line of like repressing grief or spiritual bypassing trauma or that kind of stuff yeah thank you for bringing that up I had actually thought about that um and I have it in my notes but I <laughs> ran out of time to say everything that I um, that I plan to say but yeah that is a really good point um, so yeah if there is real pain grief sadness depression anxiety um, whatever yeah whatever kind of painful experiences there are in the mind we shouldn't like pretend they're not there, deny them, suppress them. And you're right that that could happen if we're just trying to apply these tools on top of our suffering. So yeah, we do need to take care of ourselves and that's where compassion for ourself comes in. So if there is real suffering there, then we need to take care of that. So like, for example, here in the community, I think especially some of the younger members of the community who maybe haven't had so much experience with losing loved ones, losing important people. So this is kind of a, a very new experience for them. And one of these uh, younger members said, this is the hardest thing they've ever experienced in their life. I've lost many teachers and also both of my parents. So I've, you know, I had some experience in <clears throat> losing important people and um, I, can, I think I've gotten a little bit more used to that. It's not as, as upsetting to me now, but yeah, so if we're, we're in that situation of feeling a lot of grief and sadness and so on, then it's helpful to reach out for help. So I think some of the senior members are um, spending time with the younger members, giving them the chance to talk about their feelings, talk about their experiences and so on. So yeah, do what you can to take care of your, um, your painful experiences, ask for help from others. And I know also some people in this community have had, um, like childhood trauma that they had to go through and they've sought help from, um therapists yeah so we shouldn't think that we have to handle everything on our own sitting on the cushion i mean sometimes that's possible sometimes that's doable but we also have to be realistic and kind to ourselves and accept that okay this one's too hard i can't handle this on my own i need help and then it's not wrong <laughs> you know maybe traditionally and you know, traditional Buddhist countries, I don't know if they, well, they didn't really have therapists, but I think people would go and speak with their teachers. So that was one of the roles played by the Buddhist monks and nuns, you know, that people would go to them and talk and cry and, you know, uh, seek help and guidance. Yeah. 
So they played that role of that nowadays therapists are playing. So there's nothing, you know, we shouldn't feel ashamed of that or feel that that's wrong to do. I myself have sometimes sought help from, from therapists and I did find it very helpful. <clears throat> so we can um, use an, a variety of methods, you know, the Bo traditional Buddhist methods, trying those on our own, but also if we need to seek um, help from other sources, other methods, it's completely fine. <clears throat> Thank you. Here's a question about this case of disappearance of Lama. I was wondering if you have tried um, help from people who can do remote view viewing, meaning Sorry, people who do what? Remote view people who have ability to do remote view viewing. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, within the Tibetan tradition themselves, they have certain um, methods they use. They call it Mo. And there have been a number of lamas in India who have used this method and have sent advice. Um, and actually what they say is that Geshe-la is still alive, but he's just not right here. He's somewhere else and they don't know where he is. <laughs> so, so this gives us a lot of encouragement, you know, to know that, okay, he's alive. <laughs> Maybe he'll come back one day. Um, and a few people have reached out to um, psychics here in America. Um, I, I haven't been involved in that part of it, so I don't um, know what results they had. Some were quite vague, you know, like there was one person who said, oh, he's in a hole somewhere with an injured ankle. But, you know, we have 300 acres of land here. And next door to us, we have all these <clears throat> other properties with logging. I mean, there's probably thousands of holes in this area. So to find, yeah, um, some of the, yeah, some of the um, answers that have come back weren't particularly helpful. Um, but we are, yeah, we are doing that. But if you know of somebody who does remote viewing, and you could send us their name, we'd be happy to um, look into that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, hello, thank you for speaking. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about um, this disappearance. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, something you mentioned uh, early on uh, I think before the meditation, which was uh, this action of um, raising or uh, cultivating motivation and intention. Uh, and I wanted to ask how, or if you have other methods for uh, getting clarity with that, for finding it uh, regularly or recovering it um, on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a point that my teachers, Tibetan teachers, <clears throat> emphasize a lot. They say that motivation is so important. Um, it's like the, the steering wheel of a car, you know, depending on which way you turn the steering wheel, that's the direction your car is going to go in. And in a similar way, depending on the motivation we have for the actions that we do, that determines where what what the outcome will be and so they say it's so important to have a positive motivation for the things we do and um it's it's i think it's yeah it's it's a it's an ongoing process this thing of motivation um <clears throat> so here in well like in the abbey for example um everyone gets up and starts meets together and and does an hour and a half of practice in the morning and one of the first things they do is to read and contemplate a motivation that was composed by the abbess venerable Tukin children and it's um 
involves thinking of the kindness of other people and other beings and wanting to live our life in a way that we um, only benefit others and don't harm others and that we um, do everything with the goal of attaining awakening something like that that's the gist of it um, so that's one way to to go about this you could compose your own meta your own motivation you could use a motivation that was composed by um, someone else that you find really inspiring and then just start your day reading that memorizing it contemplating and in the beginning it may not be a hundred percent genuine it might be something you agree with intellectually but then when it comes to what's really going on in your mind or your heart you might think yeah, this sounds great, but I'm actually really selfish. I'm doing everything for myself, <laughs> you know, but never mind. Um, I was like that expression they use in Alcoholics Anonymous, fake it till you make it. Yeah, we have to start off with at least some kind of aspiration to have a, a positive state of mind and a positive way of living and a positive motivation be behind everything we do. And even if it's not 100% <clears throat> genuine right from the beginning, the more we think about it, contemplate it, try to generate that state of mind, the more it does become genuine. And pretty soon it is our kind of our default mode. <laughs> Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I have found in my experience. Yeah, fake it till you make it. And it, and it, yeah, it does, it is good if it's a motivation that feels right to you. So you could take ideas from other sources um, and then tweak them and use your own words, your own language, your own thoughts to come up with a motivation that feels right. And it could change over time. That might work for a while. I and mean, after a while, you might think, mm, I want to add this and I want to add that. And so you can always make adjustments to it. So, yeah, it's I mean, our teachers say it's it's good to have a positive motivation for everything we do, um, which is not easy to remember every, you know, if we're busy and we're doing many things during the day. But at least at the beginning of the day. Yeah, doing some meditation and generating a really positive motivation for the things that we do during the day. And hopefully that will um, carry through, that will influence us, um, what's that word, um, inform the actions that we do during the day. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Hello, thanks for speaking with us today. I was wondering if we might follow up for a moment on the first question and uh, giving grief its due in its right place in our right in our lives uh, without suppressing that, uh, but not causing undue suffering from it. And it appeared to me that both the question and the answer sort of lumped together pain and suffering under the same sort of umbrella. And I was wondering if you could speak to the difference between those two, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual pain versus the suffering that might be associated with that? Um, yeah, I know there's this sort of saying about, what is how does it go? Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, something like that. <laughs> so some people might distinguish pain and suffering. I mean, the, the traditional Buddhist teachings, when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, the first um, is often translated as suffering, the truth of suffering, but <clears throat> the, the, the actual term in Pali and Sanskrit is dukkha, and it includes lots of different experiences. So it can include physical pain, um, when, and then there's a whole variety of different kinds of physical pain, but it also includes mental pain. And again, there's a lot of varieties of mental pain. There's the pain of grief, which is probably the worst 
uh, su mental suffering that people can have. But then there's our little everyday like frustrations and irritations and disappointments and restlessness and so on. So basically any kind of experience that we have, physical, mental, emotional, that is unpleasant, unwanted, um, unhappy, you know, not happy and peaceful. Um, all of those are included in that term dukkha. So the term suffering isn't really such a good term for dukkha because that usually connotes something really strong and heavy and extreme. Um, but dukkha is much more than extreme cases of suffering. It, it, it's any physical or mental um, unpleasant experience, even very minor ones. And even also just the fact that our mind is not totally free, totally liberated and totally awakened, but we still have afflictions in our mind. We have greed, hatred, ignorance. So that itself is suffering even though it's not easy to recognize. Many people think everything's fine in my life. I'm fine, I'm happy, but they don't recognize that actually within their mind, there are these, um, these mental states, the afflictions, klesha, that can pop up any moment without choice and mess up the mind. So this topic of dukkha, let's use the traditional term dukkha is really vast and like I say it includes a whole variety of different kinds of experiences. This is a big subject in Buddhism. We spend a lot of time <laughs> learning about and meditating all the, on all the different types of dukkha so that we can recognize them so that we can generate the determination to free ourselves from them to get ourselves out of this situation. So that's a good question. Thank you. We haven't heard from any of the Zoom attendees. If anybody has um, a question, we have time for maybe one more. Um, anybody want to raise their hand or someone in the audience? Oh, two people. You're closer, so you win. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about AA. Is there a connection there or is it just, you just read a lot of their books or something like that? Is there a connection where? You mentioned a couple of things from AA and I'm just wondering um, if there's any connection there. That's all. Sorry. Oh, well, I have a couple of brothers <laughs> who are um, recovering alcoholics and also, yeah, a lot of people who come to Buddhist um, centers, Buddhist groups, and so on are recovered from or struggling, still struggling with that. So I just have a little bit of understanding, a little bit of awareness of AA, but not not a whole lot. But I do know there are, um, I think there are also Buddhist versions of 12 step programs. Um, yeah, you can go online and, and find those. Um, and Buddhist recovery programs. So there's some connection, yeah. <clears throat> Last question. Hi, I was interested in when you mentioned the thought, like Buddhist thought training thing, if I'm saying that right. Um, mm -hmm. And I wondered how I could learn more about that, if you had any advice about. Oh, there's lots of books, many books. Um, and um, I think you, you, you could just Google. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes it's called mind training. Sometimes it's called thought training or thought transformation. So there's different translations. Um, the Tibetan term is lojong. L-O-J-O-N-G. So you could also just Google that and that, you know, you find books and also resources to know about. And there's also a wonderful book by Thich Nhat Hanh that I'd like to recommend, um, even though he's not from the Tibetan tradition, but he 
in this book he's talking about the same thing and it's called um, no mud no lotus the art of transforming suffering just a little book and as his style is it's it's quite simple and accessible and has a lot of advice in there on how to um yeah how to deal with problems and suffering in life and transform them into things that are positive thank you <clears throat> so i think that's um it for time and questions so we just want to thank you for for joining us do you have any parting words for us no i just wish all of you the very best in your practice and your path and yeah may your compassion and your wisdom your love your patience all these good qualities that you have already inside of you may they grow more and more and more and may you all quickly reach awakening <laughs>